there. Okay, so we'll get started in a minute or so. Um, I think all the links are working. And, uh, and Yong Le said uh, you're doing PowerPoint, right? Okay. presenting, mm -hmm. uh, anyone presenting today, you guys can use the function F1 key if you want, and then it will, um, oh, that was the yeah, there's a, a, a spotlight, so then you can step around and you turn it off, you do the same thing, function F1. Okay, then you can so that gets taped down, so uh, it's easier for people to, to see your pointer. Okay. So, um, Hi, everyone. Uh, so today we have Yong Le, Kok uh, Kyung, and uh, Lin Qian presenting uh, optimal plan, uh, control and planning. Uh, so it's maybe a little smaller class today, but I hope we'll all get a chance to go through the material. And next week, we start to do the uh, model-based uh, representation. So there are actually two uh, different lectures I've put in that batch. So those of you who are on week seven, uh, perhaps you can pick and choose what things you want to go through. You don't have to go through everything. Um, and that's always a choice that you guys have when you're presenting the material. You can decide whether you want to go through all the material or go through other types of material. But again, uh, hopefully with the scribes helping out, we can keep the Slack channel or the Google Doc populated depending on how you guys have decided to do your work. OK? Um, so with that, uh, I'll let uh, Young Ler take over in a few minutes. Um, one other thing that I wanted to share with you um, separately from that is uh, on the 14 steps. So, uh, I think already 14 is there. Did my cursor go? Uh, okay. So here we already have our class D reinforcement learning. It's uh, already active. So, uh, you know, uh, we will start putting in the project information uh, this week. Yeah, it's, I haven't populated it yet. So, uh, oh, it's not showing on the screen. Ooh, okay, let me try to fix that. I actually don't know what's going down on the YouTube channel. Let's see what we can get to the screen here. That was a concern last time. It didn't work out properly. Okay. Now, now it is showing. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, 14 steps will be, I think, uh, sometime in mid April, um, towards week 13 of NUS's schedule. So uh, we'll have our deep reinforcement learning class on that Wednesday night presenting. And so all of you are supposed to be doing a project related to the course using deep reinforcement learning. Um, so some of you have participated before in previous uh, 6101 or in other classes that you've had. So it's actually a usually a pretty fun evening because you get to see what other people are doing in the school. 
Okay. Um, so just to make sure you're clear about all of this, uh, again, in the spreadsheet that we have, okay, um, if we go to the actual current assignment, right, we have all of you uh, putting down your IDs. And then later on over here, we need to make sure everyone has a project, right? So I wrote, uh, you know, trust, reinfor uh, trust reason, reinforcement policy optimization for chess. I have no idea whether that works or not, but you know, most of us have no idea whether our, our, our proposal is actually going to work, so it's going to be fun to try. Okay, so um, uh, I will be populating this information over to the website very soon, so you'll get an email from the system asking you to log in and customize a couple things and, and put your abstract and your title into the system there. Okay, um, there are certain people who've signed on for this course that. Um, actually haven't told us yet whether they're actually sticking with the course or not. So uh, there's likely to be some changes uh, to the assignment of uh, people to lectures later on uh, in the second half of the semester. But I'm trying to iron it out this week. This week is recess week, so it means we're slightly less busy. <laughs> More meetings and less teaching. Uh, so uh, hopefully that will all go, go through. Okay, so uh, without further ado, we'll come back and uh, talk about uh, the, um, let's see, what is it, uh, optimal control and planning. But uh, before we start, does anyone have any questions about uh, the schedule and what needs to be done, either here in the room or online? No? Okay. So um, uh, lastly, I'll just... Uh, let you look at the schedule again for what this course is supposed to do. Okay, so if you recall, um, we are now at uh, recess week right here, but uh, next week we'll need your abstracts. Uh, I'd like you to put them in, not to the, the project channel, it's not as helpful there, but probably put it into the steps uh, system. Okay, so you need to log it there. I'll try to clean this uh, website up as well as tell you on the Slack channel where to put it. Okay. And then there's nothing else that you need to do uh, for the course, for the project, until you actually have to print your poster and then uh, present your project at the end, which will be on 18th of April. Uh, sorry, 17th of April, because uh, our course is always on Thursday, so week 14 is uh, Thursday. So 17th of April is actually 14 steps. It's Wednesday evening. Okay. And as always, uh, steps as a project showcase has prizes. So um, there will be prizes awarded to people in this class. Um, you know, it's usually a, a small token amount, like $75 or something like that. But it'd be really great, for example, if somebody from NTU uh, takes the prize away from students at NUS. You know, it's always nice to have some, you know, competition in that sort. So I, I'm, uh, we'll, we'll be very happy to have all of you participate. Okay, so without further ado, let's turn it over to uh, Yong Le for uh, his, uh, our lecture on optimal planning and control. And I will check that it's getting uh, put out correctly. Let's see. Yeah, it, it's there. Okay. So uh, for, for today's uh, the lecture on optimal planning and control is uh, actually not that like complex in the sense that it, there's not much of the learning involved but more of the like understanding what is a model based reinforcement learning and how to like optimize it as optimization problem rather than a learning problem so uh, at the start uh, Sergey uh, re like recap like what 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 is the objective of a reinforcement learning so what we are trying to do is we're trying to like get the policy out of the world so there's a there's a uh, this is our policy and this is the probability of the transition, the transition probability, the transition matrix in this sense. So for model free, what, what we have done so far is that we just ignore the probability of the probability, the transition probability. So we assume that we can always like, like we can always get our result by by either by it being deterministic or in our sense in our case was we, we assume that it was like sampling, we sample it rather than like like get the probability. So we sample and we assume that the probability is around the same. So we'll learn it. So is it okay? So uh, we just sample instead of getting the probability. So which is about the same. So we don't even attempt, we don't attempt to learn the probability transition. So uh, like 
what if we like knew, know like the transition probability? So this will help us like get the get the answer like get the optimal uh policy even if like even if like we, we don't really have a really good learning because you don't really need learning if you know the transition probability. It's just an optimization problem. So like so oftentimes we really actually know like the transition probability in in the case of games simulated environment or we can model like. Uh, for example, the car or that, like they said, that's physics, so we can just actually model it. So we can also learn the probability of the, the transition probability in this sense that, because you can just treat it as a, like, a parameter and fit, how you fit the transition probability. So if you know the transition probabilities, it makes things uh, a lot easier, because we can just treat it as an optimization problem. So it's okay, right? Yeah. So, uh, this model-based reinforcement learning, like for, for this, it, it's just this, like we're trying to get this, this is the transition probability, which is in this sense, they say system dynamics, which is like the, the, the underlying simulation, like how it works. So uh, the notation wise, uh, X is the same as S and U is the same as our action A. It's just uh, different people using different notation. So it's actually not that hard for this in this, so uh, for this, this, this week's uh, lecture is just more of like, how do we, how do we uh, with the knowledge of this transition probability, how do we get a like, good action to do? Uh, not exactly the policy. Okay, so uh, yeah, then you say like, what we'll be doing next week and stuff. Yeah, okay. So uh, yeah, back to the uh, recap of uh, what is, uh, or is our objective in the reinforcement learning? So our objective is to like minimize the probability of us getting eaten by the tiger in this sense in the time step. So we don't want to get eaten by a tiger in this example. So the overall objective would be like we try and minimize the probability of us getting eaten by a tiger in all time steps. When and we want to constrain it so that our next state is consistent with the previous state. So you don't we don't skip states. So it's just, we, we can transition. That's just the objective. So it's like, should be relatively simple to understand for this. Yeah. And next, uh, for the deterministic case, so how do we uh, actually maximize our reward in the deterministic, deterministic case? We just, yeah, just, just get the argument max of all of the time steps, all of the steps in this case. So it's just getting the, like getting the choosing the best result every time, and you just get optimal result in the deterministic case. So, uh, what is the like? What if it's like not deterministic, but like stochastic? Stochastic, yeah. yeah, which is like probability. That's probably involved. So, in this in this case, we'll just get the like the, the expected. We'll choose the, the best expectation, the highest expectation. Yeah, but however, like. Like Sergey said that uh, this is not really optimal because since you are you are only like sampling and you are only like using the probability the expectation it may not be like op the optimal result like it is expected optimal but it may, it may not be the true optimal yeah like in this sense uh. so yeah if you take the action and you expect it to be optimal it it may not be the optimal so even if the expectation is optimal right? you get it right like. <laughs> right, I mean, if you take this action because this is the highest probability of getting to the optimal answer, but you may not get to that because it's a probability. You may, there's a chance of you not doing getting that out answer. So, like, uh, for example, if you buy lottery, you may not get the you may not get you may not win even though that's the optimal. Yeah, yeah in this sense, something like that. Yeah, so. Because our action don't guarantee that we get to the destination because there's a transition probability. So uh, then the, he, he go back to talk about the terminology that's a closed loop and open loop. So for closed loop, it's like every time, every time you do something, you get, you get back a state in return. Then you, you choose your state like, with respect to this state. Whereas for open loop system, it's more like you, you get a state at the initial state, then you have to you have to list out all your actions you want to do, then in between you cannot really do anything. So it's a it's called a non-feedback system. In the sense that you don't really get the feedback of your actions. Yeah. 
So it's like you, you need to predetermine all your policies and just follow through it with it. So this is just the terminology. So uh, what if it's uh, what is a uh, uh, what if it's a strategic closed loop system? So it's just uh, you need to like up max. We need to like get the highest, the maximum expectation of our actions, which can be learned. Which the policy can be learned uh, using neural network or in this case, in our case today, we'll be just learning using a LQR, which is like optimization method. So uh yeah so now we'll be doing like uh, like because it's easier to talk about op open loop because like you assume you, you don't you don't think of like every single step choosing an action because it's it's complex and very hard to do the math so you assume that you get you, you do open loop planning so you get a state then after that you have to plan out all the all the different actions you have to do to get to the result so next uh is on strategic Optimization and multi of tree search. Oh, yeah. So before we get there, yeah. I, uh, any I question? Uh, question. Yeah. Um, is is open loop planning a, uh, sorry is closed loop planning a special case of open loop planning? Uh, are, are they mutually exclusive? Are they subsets of each other? Right. So if we look at the terminology on this slide, right, on the right hand side of the slide, for those of you who are remote, right, it says that the open loop means we take, uh, we, we get one state, but you make plans for a set of actions all the way to horizon T, right? And the closed loop state says uh, you, you just do it for one time step at, at some small, small time step T. I think closed loop is a special case. Yeah. Closed loop is a special case of open loop. It, it assumes that t equals 1. Is that correct? Are there any other differences that you can highlight? Or, or, it, or is that really the only difference? So, we do prediction like how long we predict only the next step, or we predict multiple steps. But they are the same, they don't the same. Okay. Does anyone want to argue the other way? That Open loop is a special case mm -hmm. of closed loop. So, Lisa, you want to elaborate? <laughs> 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 I think it's actually the other way. Open loop is a special case of closed loop. Oh, yeah, yeah. Closed loop means that after you take an action, you get the state, then based on the new state, you take another action. Do it for whatever number of steps you want. Open loop is a special case because you can just ignore the, you can just decide I'm going to take this A1 to AT and ignore whatever you receive. You uh, just nullify the state information coming back. You don't back. care, whatever I, whatever I see, I throw away. Because it is true, ST can be there for zero. Just a number matter of how many steps. Are there any other differences? So there's this difference about what state information you get, right? In open loop case, you get it only once at s equals one, right? And uh, for the closed loop, you get it at every time step. As soon as you get an action, you get back the state, and then you you can you can use that state. I guess your your policy conditions on knowing the state, right? That's what the conditional probability says. So you must do your planning at each time step. You move, you replan, you remove, you replan every step, right? Okay. So I think these are, are, are pretty basic, uh, uh, but good to, to review. And like, Sergey also mentioned, like, uh, someone asked during his lecture, what's the difference between closed loop and open loop and on policy and off policy? So, like, I mean, the, the, the difference is that, that on policy and off policy is how your like, policy learns, like how your learner learns, whereas this is the different where you plan for the future. So that's the difference in the sense that everybody understands it better. For purposes of recap, yeah. does anyone want to define what on policy and off policy means? Yeah. 
it should be hopefully somewhat clear after you've had it pushed in your head a couple of times. <laughs> On policy means every time you got a new policy, you got to resample again to, to get your data set changed. And then off policy, you don't have to do the resampling every single time you update your policy. Yeah. Okay, so that's a, about the sampling, right? Yeah. So um, off policy means that you, your your policy can deal with trajectories or actions that are not possibly generated by the policy, right? So. Yeah, even if you've never seen that particular state or that particular transition before, you know what to do with it. You know how it's relevant to your policy, right? So the way you could do that is through what? What thing did we learn from Sergey's lecture that you can do? With? Important sampling, right? All right. So we, we, we assign it some importance that some fraction of how similar it is to another known piece of information we know, right? Through that uh, algebraic manipulation that he showed a couple weeks ago, right? Uh, on, in an on-policy setting, we don't have that capability. Basically, every time we have a policy, uh, we can only evaluate things that the policy can generate. And that's why, uh, as pointed out just now by... Uh, forgotten your name uh, but Yihui. Hi. Yihui. Yihui. Yeah. as pointed out by Yihui, we have to throw away a lot of sampling information and that can be incredibly wasteful because a lot of these types of things you need to iterate many times right so it can be very slow so how does on policy and off policy relate to closed loop and um, open loop does it at all first of all because that was the question that the student raised uh, during the lecture. Any takers online or offline? You guys want to say anything? And this would be your exam question if you had an exam. <laughs> so you should have an opinion about it either way, true or false. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yes, please. So, me that open should be linked more towards off policy. Off policy? Okay. And and why why would you say that? It seems to be kind of fixed. They will just follow A1 to A2. Okay. So if you, you follow that uh, particular course of actions, then you're generating off policy. Is that right? Okay. Good try. Uh, I don't actually know exactly the answer either, but um, I think that's why we're in a discussion group. So does anyone have a dissenting opinion or a different idea about that? Uh, uh, what, he, what he actually explained is that, like, I, I'm not sure how I understand it is correct or not. Because you see, if on, lo on policy and off policy, policy is just like whether, whether the policy you get in the end, can you use other people's sample to learn? So in this sense, it's not really related to open loop and closed loop because open loop and closed loop doesn't really tell you whether you are using your own sample or you're using other people's sample. It's just like how you get your actions. One is related to the policy and one is related to how your policy applies to the world. That's how I understand it. Anybody understand it? I don't know. I'm not sure. Another way to phrase it is on policy, off policy is a learning. This is a thing. Well, same thing. So they're orthogonal to each other. So um, they're, they're not really congruent. Uh, but there are some similarities, right? Uh, when, when you think about a trajectory, you're taking it from multiple time steps. Therefore, you might think it's more correlated with the open loop scenario 
because uh, in an off-policy setting, maybe you would have to deal with samples from a trajectory that's not generated by your policy. So I think the answer is correct that it's not it's not um, it's not correlated at all, but uh, there there are some similarities. Any other points that you guys want to bring up? Is it helpful to have these types of discussion? Because I, I, I am myself not that sure of all the content. So um, it's, I think, useful for me at least to, to ask you to think about it. I think it's useful because sometimes you might just skip over a point and not think about the implications. OK, good. So I'll continue to interject uh, once in a while when I'm not clear. But I would appreciate if all of you can do the same because, you know, that that's why we have the discussion group. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, continuing on. So, uh, like for example, if we have the transition probability, then we can treat this like a optimization problem in a sense. So, uh, the next next presenter will be like explaining like how to actually optimize this this problem. Uh, in using statistic optimization and Monte Carlo tree search. Yeah. Sorry, uh, before that, they got say ah. something okay. about the global <laughs> yeah, and okay. local, right? Yeah. What, 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 what does it mean to be global? What does it mean to be local? The, the neural net versus the time varying linear thing. Like how I understand it is that global, in the sense that neural net can, like, can do any equations. Local is because this this way of doing it is only suitable for like, like this case where you know the stuff. I think my answer is a bit different. Okay. I think the neural net is global in the sense that you have everything, uh, the information in the neural net. But the time varying linear there is that you only have it, it's considered local because you know what's happening at time g. Oh, yeah. From what I understand, uh, also is is closer to the second answer is that the the, the policy isn't optimizing for uh, in a neural net isn't optimizing for any particular time step. It's trying to optimize the policy for the entire uh, existence of the problem. And uh, I think what he was hinting at in the lecture is that training a neural network is time consuming. Um, so it's probably not such a great idea to uh, use an entire neural network, train it, and optimize it if you're only going to use it for a couple time steps. So, for example, you might uh, get away with a policy that's a lot more simpler uh, by using a, a very simple uh, learning system like linear regression. Right? But the whole point is that you would cut um, the policy into parts that are specific to each time you know, cut, cut the, the trajectory into certain times pieces, right? And then uh, find a, a, a linear approximation that's for that particular segment from t equals some number to t uh, plus, I don't k, right? So a, a couple time steps. And uh, that would be sort of like a, a temporally local policy that you're optimizing using some type of Taylor approximation or something like that. Something simple. Because again, you may be taking a lot of actions over many time steps. So there's no point in, in, in trying to find a neural network to get your entire policy. But again, that's my understanding of what he said. Is there some relation to control theory where if your if the if your system can be approximated by a linear model, then you don't need a huge neural network? To learn it, whereas if you're so like if you're you're balancing just one inverted pendulum, you can learn a simple model by this. It's linked pendulums stack on top of each other. It suddenly become highly non more complicated. Model. I think so. Yeah, you, you can think of well, I don't know whether this is the right analogy, so those of you who know more can, can say. Uh, so when you have a, a couple inverted pendulums stacked on each other, I guess in this sense, it's sort of like having 
several of these piecewise problems all stuck together in their trajectory, right? So each of the linear pieces, uh, each of the pieces may be simple enough to be solved by a linear system, right? But if you stack all of them together, then it, you probably need a much more complex representation. So if you're doing all of the open loop planning, perhaps using a neural network to do it would make more sense because you're not getting feedback at every step about the state, right? You just plan one time and you just close your blinders or you don't have access to state information to do a couple steps before you get any feedback, right? That, that would be my response to that. I think this point comes up again in next week's lecture. So I started watching next week's lecture already. Um, but he's talking about all of these cases where, you know, in, in certain cases it may be okay, even if it, in an off-policy setting, for example, you, you have a state that's very close to a state that you already know, and then you're just going to uh, do some similarity calculation and, uh, you know, approximate an adjustment so that it looks more like the, the current state, sort of like in Port example, but from an action point of view rather than a state point of view. Oh, good question. Okay, let's thank our presenter, Young Love, for the Okay, good afternoon. Uh, let me continue here. Uh, so, plastics, uh, optimization, and multi color T church. So, um, they say that we have to solve this uh, optimization problem. He's going to just do the uh, open loop and uh, and she said, that, you know, uh, when you're solving this, right, you can just forget about what the, what the real meaning of this. You know, forget that there are time steps, forget that there are planning, and you just solve it as an optimization problem and not to worry about anything. And um, just like any optimization problem. Okay, this is one approach that you see. Um, so you want to treat this as a, any optimization problem and we maximize the records. And uh, then, you know, so she's saying is that, um, So we don't really care what is inside here, you know, this is just a um, very, uh, so we extract away the optimal control of planning and, you know, whatever meaning we have been talking about, you know, they say come to here, we just forget about it and we just treat it as a normal optimization and we just optimize this to get the maximum reward. Now, he actually said that one of the simplest ways we could guess and check, or we call it the random shooting method and we say that because if you Thing that guess and check doesn't sound cool, right? I mean, you can call it the random shooting method. <laughs> Say, what you do is you just pick A1 to AN on some distribution, maybe uniform, and then you know, then you just choose A, uh, then you just solve this, and then you just choose them. So he said that, you know, surprisingly, a lot of time it works, uh, you know, and <laughs> uh, I, I believe him. <laughs> After I try out, then I will, I will come back to say that I will challenge him. But I'm not, I cannot be challenging him at this moment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then next one, they actually talk about this uh, closed entropy method. Uh, this one actually makes more sense to me. Uh, because you're saying that we'll pick A1 to AN from some distribution. Uh, for example, uniform. But he said that actually Gaussian mode better. Again, I believe him, right? <laughs> at this moment. <laughs> So what happened is you say that maybe these are the steps you chose, and then you realize that you know uh, these two points are actually give you good reward. Then you actually choose more points around around these two. Then after that, maybe it's for example from here to here you see good reward. Then you choose more points around here, and you go on and on. Now. And then uh, I think this is actually a bit my my uh, good thing will happen to if you are around good people. <laughs> <laughs> This is how, I mean, a lot, a lot of our, our theory work about cash, right? Uh, you know, if you are assessed, highly likely the next time you'll be assessed. So what he actually, I think that is the intuitive of this method. Saying that if you actually choose them and you find uh, that these, between these two are having good reward, right? Then you will dig, uh, digger deeper here. And then you find between here, then you dig, digger some more. So that means that the good stuff will be in between good stuff, right? And, um, uh, it makes sense, but I believe that there may be some cases where you know some of the good stuff may be here. We don't know, but that, but in terms of probability, I think uh, yeah, this is a, a kind of methods that you can use. 
So do you guys care to elaborate on this part at all? Well, what types of problems or domains might be better suited for a cross-entropy method and which ones wouldn't? Hmm. I think it depends on the distribution that you are actually using to add up the, the distribution that you are fitting in with, right? Because because if it's my model, like you have two peaks, and then you know, it's not going to work that well. Right. So in the lecture, there was that exact question, right? Yes, yes, uh, yes. If what happens if you got good things on either side, and the, yeah. the mean if you represent with a Gaussian distribution is pretty terrible, right? Yeah. So the, the the good points are on either side of the distribution. Do you remember his response to that? It says that unless you're um, exactly symmetrical, you always get one side, and then this one will, in the long run, fit to the the side that's slightly you know have higher probability density. That's okay, I guess. Yeah. yeah, his answer is just like that. It's like, yeah. you just choose the biggest one. Yeah, you know? And then you just one. go further, you will be there. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Right. So, so it depends, like, like, that might not be really what you want, because like, in the case, like, you really you want to really cover the both, both distribution, that, that really might not be the uh, ideal yeah. mm -hmm. Other Other comments or thoughts about this? more suited towards uh, continuous action series. Why do you say that? I think I agree with you, but... ...in on a continuous I was just thinking of buying all the mystery. If you're playing Pong, uh -huh. you flash that right. The discrete action like that, but you can't really take that in between. Right, you'll just sit there and you'll die, right? Because the, the ball has come either to the left or the right. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. Uh, it, I, I think it has less to do with the uh, and you guys, please correct me if I'm wrong. It has less to do with the distribution of the sampling uh, rather than the distribution of how the rewards are looking like. So it depends on the manifold of the rewards. If the rewards are highly discontinuous, okay, then using a Gaussian or anything to approximate it is probably going to run into trouble because your, your local continuity of your reward function is probably not going to work out very well. All right, so like... Uh, Kyung was saying, what happens if the good things, there is a really high green bar in between the first two yellow bars on the left side? You'll never see it, right? Because you, you've you taken uh, all, all the samples and it looks higher between the two left bars, uh, sorry, right bars, yellow right bars. So uh, you, you sample the green bars there, right? So I think it has a, a bit to do with, you know, the, the reward uh, distribution, right? the underlying distribution of what you're measuring. If it's nice and smooth, that's great, but uh, there are many problems where that's not the case, right? So when you're trying to optimize neural networks, we already know it's not a, uh, you know, a convex function, right? It has a lot of local minimum, and you have these problems. So curiosity, so right now, like, they're using a single Gaussian for this whole thing, right? But, like, if you're saying that, okay, let's say we have a bimodal kind of thing, it's, pos it's possible that we use instead like a Gaussian mixture, right? Like saying then we then when we fit like the, the elites, then we're defeating like two means, and then that might really that might cover some of the problem. But then, then you know maybe maybe the top one is all uh, the way on the left side, right? Then, yeah. Would that have work? I think that would probably work as well. I, I don't see any problem with using a Gaussian mixture model. To determine where you want to put the probabilities. After all, you're only getting a probability distribution. You're using that to sample. So whatever you use to sample that is fine. Uh, you know, just because you have more parameters makes it a slightly harder estimation problem. Um, but I think that would handle the bimodal problem fine. But I, I think Sergey's point is even if it's bimodal, who cares, right? Because <laughs> yeah. you you just want one action, right? So if if both of the uh, Modes of the two Gaussians are equally good, then 
there's no distinction, right? So you just pick one, and it doesn't matter, right? And you're optimizing against that. So what I think he's saying is that it, it's doing some local hill climbing, right? It's, it's just picking the maximum and then choosing to go there and then investigating around that area and choosing to get it. Yeah. So it's sort of like, I would say, like stochastic uh, gradient ascent, right? Because this is a reward function, you're just going up, right? And so all of the, the normal search problems apply here, right? So you might say at the beginning, I don't know where the good stuff is, so I'm going to allow more exploration. I'm going to use a more complicated or um, less uh, put uh, put more of a smoothing effect on the distribution so that I can do some more exploration. Wisan, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, but I, I, I think that would be fine. So even though it's a, a simple method, perhaps it works very well for a lot of problems, especially in the continuous space where we don't expect uh, uh, actions with slightly continuous uh, values to have much difference. Except, of course, if you drive off the cliff, then you have a very different <laughs> function. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's, it's just going to be slightly worse or slightly better and you expect a response uh, from your, your value function or your Q function to reflect that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so they go on to actually describe the, um, uh, I think it is, it is continuous values, uh, inputs. So it's most of them better. And you say that this method actually should just sample A1 to AN, and then from the uh, distribution, then you evaluate all the reward, then you pick the elites, uh, you know, value, then you refit again, and then you go back and back. This is what we actually, you just put in the pseudo code of what we just now discussed. So this method will discerning well in the optimizing uh, dimension is only in the order of 50 to 100. Uh, this method is a global optimization method, and, and, and he say that, he say that he will converge. Uh, Any question? No, I will move on. So are we clear why it does converge? Anyone want to sketch out why? Like you can, can you can you imagine a a, a reward function like this this J function that he mentions? Let's say you only have one dimension, right? Like what we saw on the last slide. Why, why would such a procedure actually converge? Anyone online want to comment? This is your chance because everyone here wants to be quiet. <laughs> And he does go on to say, right, uh, on this slide, it works well if the optimization dimension is not too big. I take 50 to be, uh, 50 and 100 to be not too big rather than very large. I don't know. That's my guess. No takers? How about locally? Anyone want to say why it might be able to converge? Well, there's one condition missing, right? There, there must be a termination criteria in there. There's actually no termination criteria. So I would assume that, you know, when, when the, the distribution doesn't change a lot, right, or, or you get a, 
a reward that's um, not shifting a lot, then you would have a termination criteria, right? But um, I guess it also depends. Uh, one thing is clear is that the rewards are not changing, right? There's they're static. You're just trying to sample to find the one that's the highest. Wouldn't the termination condition be that if you pick the elites AI1 to AIM, and then uh, step four, when you do the, when you refit the thing and you get back, uh, so basically when, when you do back uh, another time, if you pick the same elites, isn't that a convergence condition? Yeah, I think so. Uh, so there's that clause at the end with the highest value where M is less than N. So I, I guess if you pick the elites and you generate the same distribution, you would pick them again. All right. uh, it's not that clear. Uh, yeah, because step three is uh, is deterministic. It says just pick the you know the ones with the maximum number, right? Okay. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I I think this would converge as long as your probability distribution is changing to be more and more sharp over time. Right, so you would probably need some tuning factor for that um, to, to make sure it does converge. Any, any insight from the rest of you? Sounds a bit strange because you say it's global optimization. Does that mean, does he mean it will find the global optimum? I don't think so, right? Because I don't think it guarantees the optimum from this, right? Even with any type of cooling rate, I don't think it's designed to get a, a global optimum. It can only get some local local optimum. So, what is it? so when you say converge, it means it converges to a single point? It converges to pick a particular action, I think. OK. That's, that's my that's guess. That's the definition of convergence. Uh, is, is that right? I'm not sure. I think so. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think it won't diverge, right? I mean, <laughs> that's all. Maybe the global optimization is here wrong, yes, wrong, but the, he did say that it will converge, but if you look at the methods, right, I don't think it will get out. <laughs> I mean, at least it won't get out, right? Because at the end of the day, you will still pick one, right? Yeah, because for the third uh, step, mm -hmm. like for each iteration, so you just pick M elites, which is less than the number yes. that's last round. Yeah. And then eventually, you just yeah. only one left. And I, I'm not sure whether that one is actually. Oh, you're you meaning it's it's shrinking in value. Your M and N are always but shrinking. Elites is shrinking. Yeah. The, the elites number are of shrinking. elites that you're picking is shrinking a bit. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, but it's not converging to the global optimal. I guess that's that's the. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that, that global there is a little bit uh, okay. yeah. Yeah, not a very good usage, right? Because I think we all agree it, won't con it doesn't necessarily converge to a global optimum. But you will pick one. It will, yeah. You will pick, uh, yeah, you will pick one. Uh, yeah, I might pick Donald Trump, for instance. <laughs> and it happened. <laughs> that, that's a local optimum, <laughs> for some people at least. So I'm just imagining for the last iterations, right, we only sample just one action from the probability distribution, and we just take that one. Okay. <laughs> so you're saying every time we shrink M and N in a recursive, and then it'll, it'll come down to a single point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, it's not clear to me whether N and M are actually shrinking, uh, but yeah, if, if that's the case, then. It should string. Yeah, I mean, if he's, if he, if he wants it to string, maybe he should have like a notation <laughs> and such that he knows that M and N is different from every single round, you know? Like mm -hmm. every iteration, you get a different M and N. Yeah, the only thing that it says is that step four, the distribution changes, right? So yeah. the distribution is scale free. It doesn't matter on, on M and M. <laughs> so it's not very clear. Okay. Shall we go on? Okay, you say what's the upside? It's uh, very fast, it's parallelized, and uh, extremely simple, okay, and uh, very harsh dimensionality limits, 
and it's only for open loop planning. Yeah, okay. So these are the things that we went through. Yeah, it's really simple, yeah. I mean, it's, and it looks like it's gonna be quite fast. So let's take the first the easy question. Why is it paralyzable? Is this paralyzable? So I'm not sure what, what, what is paralyzable. Meaning that you can assign different CPUs or GPU units to compute some part of the steps. Step two is paralyzable. We go back to step two uh, on the previous slide. What 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 step was that? Yeah, just press up. Yeah, you think the different actions that. Sample the, the different action samples that you get, so you can actually feel it on like it's different nodes, I guess. Right, so the idea is you have n nodes, right? Yeah. Each node picks an action, hopefully a different action, right? You could assign it that way, or you could just say, heck with it, it's, it's all continuous, so I just sample, run a random variable, sample a value, and then uh, evaluate the state, right? Uh, get the j value to report function. Right. So that's paralyzable. So uh, you know, I, just like we saw in the other cases, you might have an update server or something like that. Uh, go assign 20, 20 workers to go pick a state and then, sorry, pick an action, evaluate the state that results from that, then give the value back. And then uh, you are picking the leads from all of those. So even though you have assigned 20 workers as N, uh, you pick five of them as M as the highest five values. Uh, high, highest uh, valued actions, and then you refit the, the probability distribution against that, right? Okay, what about the second part of that slide? So he said that it is only for open loop planning. Why is it only for open loop? Why can't you uh, use it for closed loop? Or, or we can do the easier one, right? He also says, there's a harsh dim dimensionality limit. And he, he did discuss this a little bit inside the lecture, if you recall. You want to do the easy one, which is number one, or the harder one? Well, it's not really that hard, much harder, number two. Let, let's do number one first, then, because I actually know the answer to that one. <laughs> so why is there a harsh dimensionality limit with, with that? So those of you who covered the lecture, do you remember what he he said about this part. I guess all three of you watched it. Do you remember? If you don't, it's okay. It's a discussion group. So this is a, a key problem with high dimensionality. It's called the curse of dimensionality. I think you've all heard it before. So what does the curse of dimensionality say? It's basically connected to the same thing uh, that uh, the first upside number one is. It's very, very fast and paralyzed, right? But when you have a high dimensional problem, in order to cover the space reasonably well, you will need exponential number of samples, right? Because each dimension requires you to sample X, you know, that much more time, right? In order for you to get a, enough saturation of the samples for it to make sense. If you only have five tries, at uh, 20 tries of sampling a 500 dimensional space, basically you're just shooting you know, randomly everywhere, right? So you're not gonna be able to uh, uh, get any guess at what the terrain or, or the manifold looks like based on those 20 shots in the dark. You would need many, many more samples in order for you to get some idea of what the local landscape looks like, right? So that's the downside of, of, of something like this because you have a high dimensional problem, basically sampling doesn't work anymore, right? It's just a general problem, right? But why is it uh, the case for, it's only for open loop planning? I'm 
It's because you need to know all the actions. You need to know all the actions. You need to know all the actions? Yeah. Okay. I'm actually not sure what the answer for this one is. I, I, I think it looks like it's okay for open loop planning, <laughs> closed loop planning too. I, I can see it's very expensive to do. Uh, maybe that's one reason why, but I don't remember what Sergey said in the lecture about why it's only suitable for open loop. Okay, so it, it may be because of something like what uh, Kok Kyung was saying. Then you say, what comes to planning that you say? Right. Yeah. So, okay, for close to planning, you either want a policy or, yeah, I don't know, depend on what, what you use for policy. You could use a tree, like it's a conditional plan, it's a tree. I guess trying to do this for tree is a bit hard. So this is supposed to be the precursor to the MCST, right? So I, I yes. guess this is why he's saying that <laughs> only for open loop planning you do something that simple, right? So he wants to introduce the fix to it, which is the MCTS, uh, right? Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I thought about it. I don't think, like, if you go to the previous slide, um, yeah, I don't think the M is actually getting smaller. So I think they are, they are always picking N number of samples because they pick the elites, right? And then they are refitting the probability distribution and they're just throwing away the, the elites. Mm. So I don't think the M actually changed throughout every single iteration. But I think the convergence will, of, to, to actually uh, action just come from the fact that you are assigning uh, probability uh, high probability for, for, for those actions with higher uh, uh, rewards, I guess. And then in the long run, as you assign, you, even if you get like two um, iteration with the same probability, but after you do it a, a, a long time, there's always going to be rewards, one reward that's higher than the other, and that reward will get the slight, uh, will get slightly uh, higher density, and that why, that's, therefore you will get a conversion to a, to a value. Yeah, but it's not, it's not converging because the n is smaller than n. It's because there's always that hill climbing aspect, yeah, right? It's yeah. monotonically increasing in value. Yeah. So you always arrive at some local maximum. Yeah. I think that that's correct. That's a good point. Okay. okay then I thought that he move on to a Monte Carlo tree search, and this is basically for discrete uh, planning. Uh, so we use it as a we take it as a as a as a search problem. Uh, he was using this uh, frame Atari game as a as an example for a search problem. So uh, what happened that you start from uh, state S one and there are always two possible action because for this game is only left and right, right? You can't go anywhere. Uh, eventually we will search deep into the tree that uh, win the game. Now the important the, the problem is that we this will lead to exponential expansion. I mean you cannot be uh, you cannot go on and on to expand. The, the tree to get to the final. You cannot expand fully to then to, to find the solution because you'll be too expensive. Yeah. Any question on this? No. Oh. Uh, so, so he said that we are not trying to find the best, uh, only trying to see what is the reward for a particular set of action. So you can say that, uh, why don't we just randomly choose, and then we, we see how we go. Uh, so they they say just now we say that we are we are, we are able to uh, do the full tree right. Then how how are we supposed to approximate the value without the full tree? So you say that we will try. We just um, uh, randomly select and then you will actually try and then intuitive intuition choose a node with best reward uh, intuition tell us that you know every time you, you for example these two right uh, you'll probably go to the 15 right you'll go to the 15 because um, uh, you know 
But if, but if he say that, you know, what if after that 10, you know, uh, later is 100, you know, so you should like, you know, uh, but of course this, this example that you should not go to 15, but you should go to 10. Then after that, the, the big reward is there. But the trouble is that nobody know, right? So what he want to do is that he also prefer rarely visited node. Okay, yeah, that means you want to go to the node that is rarely visited. Uh, as you say here, for example, after the 10, maybe they are plus 100. So he said that we cannot keep only trying the branch with a better uh, reward. Uh, we also want to try those rarely visited uh, too. The whole idea is that he wanted uh, to actually uh, to try to start from somewhere and, and, and just uh, a sample. And, and the, he do not want to, for example, you say 50, uh, from these two speed, right? You go down 15, then go down, or oh, the other one 20, the 10, just go down 10, 20, and, and the whole branch of uh, all the best reward because it doesn't work that way. Uh, so generic uh, MCTS sketch, or you find the leaf S1 using the tree policy. Uh, then you evaluate the leaf using the default policy. Then we update all the tree in between S1, and we take the best action. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> we decided to start playing for some reason. <laughs> a good, uh, Time to have a break. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the phone is uh, sick of me talking about this. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, I will try my best to briefly talk about because he actually spent a lot of time here. And uh, he was saying that you know, the reward here, and he also introduced an end to say that the number of times that this, um, this node is visited. And, and he actually included this end into this uh, thing so that he would take, uh, take care to actually uh, try to also not to visit just the one with the highest um, reward, but also those that is very uh, uh, visited. So are we clear about what a default policy and the tree policy are? If you're not, nod your head, no, <laughs> because otherwise we can skip that. I, I'm not too sure, because I actually, after that, I'm now reading the paper that he's recommending. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I also find very to find UCT. <laughs> I think I think what you're saying is that the default policy is just a random policy, whereas the tree policy yes. is this. Right. That's what I understand. Yeah. Because you cannot use tree policy on everything, so you just use the default policy to make it fast. Yeah. So the default policy is just to do random sampling, right? Or or any other default, some reasonably low cost way of determining an action. Because uh, as uh, Sergey said during the lecture. The objective is not to actually uh, figure out the best state, it's to get an approximate value for the node, right? So any how you do that is fine. So uh, doing a uniform distribution or a sampling at random is, is perfectly fine. So that's the default. But the tree policy is trying to balance the uh, exploitation versus exploration problem, right? So there we have a specific way of scoring a node and then Fit, uh, balancing both, you know, the sampling part, which is the n, right? So the lower the n, that means I don't know enough about that space. I'm pretty unsure about what happens there, right? And the q, which is the value of the node, right? So q is you know, a normal thing, right? It's a reward function. So I, I, I want to get basically uh, a better approximation of q, but I also want to have my confidence interval shrinking, right? I want to more closely determine what the right Q value is. Uh, but for Q values that are low, if I have a very large variance in my approximation, I'd rather go figure out something on that side to lower it, right? So my confidence bound is smaller, right? So I, I, every time I take an action, uh, I, I, well, every time I'm uh, evaluating the search, I'm trying to uh, jointly optimize for these two parts, right? Uh, idea that I find a good Q value and then I also lower the, the uh, variance of, of my confidence between the approximations. So is the 2C square root, that's the variance, is it? The 2C part, let's see. So I didn't take this equation. I was listening to it in the car without watching the video. So. Um, what is C? It's a hyperparameter. It's a hyperparameter of the two. Yeah. Okay, so you can decide how much 
uh, exploration and that exploitation you want, right? Yeah. So then can we figure out what that term is in the square root two of log oh. n st minus one versus n of st? What's n of st minus one? It's the parents. The parents. parents. Okay, parents visit count versus the visit count of this particular node. So how does that work? It gets bigger when... And the parents has a lot of count, but like, uh, but your child only has one. So it keeps going to the parent, but like it didn't go down to that particular node. So then you see that bonus. So if it keeps going to the parents and it keeps going down to the particular node, then you don't really get much uh, from it. Yeah, so that's my idea. So what's in the square root is always a, a, a number greater than one, is that right? Uh, it has to be, right? By definition of how n is defined, right? Because your n count is always bigger for the parent than the child. Yeah, but you right? long it though. Oh yeah, you log. Yeah, so it might not be, it might have been like a, yeah, so, so the parents actually increase slower than, than the child. Yeah. The score is the Q value, right? Yeah. Uh, the score so is score the... is equivalent? No, no, no score not... is this. this... This thing on the left hand side, right? Yeah. Q is the score of the node, right? I think Q the is score is the on. score for which node to expand. Is yeah, that right? Yeah. yeah, it's two different things. Okay. But ultimately, we're going to pick an action that's based on Q, right? Because I want to pick that best action. I don't care whether to explore any action. Yeah, is that right? <laughs> this is for the learning. I think this is for the no, learning of the queue. Okay. This is for the learning. Yeah, this for the search. You use the queue at the root. Okay. Yeah, so so like, I take it as score of ST is this, uh, the sort of like the priority whether to look at this node expanded or not. Is that right? Yes. Uh, so like like I think if, if it gets big enough, like let's say your your parents uh, number of times your parents visited and then the number of times that uh, so the n for parents and n for yours is kind of equivalent, then, then the right term just cancels out and it becomes the average time like then q over n is just the average number, right? So the right hand turn is just for the this gives you like a slight boost if if it doesn't actually visit this node, but like the parents have been visited a lot of times. Right. But so when they, when it actually, when, when actually adds up the Q, right, do they add a score or do they just add a Q? Sorry, I didn't like, like, catch that. Like, so, so when you go down the node, right, uh, mm -hmm. I think like, what, when you, once you extend the node, node out, right, you, you're supposed to kind of back propagate up the, the, the Q value and then Add it to your parents, right, and increase the count of your parents. Right. Right. So, does it add the Q? It adds the Q value, or does it add the score value? It adds the Q value. Q value, which is the one that you, you get from using your default policy, right? Right. So, I think, for example, here, here, this score was originally ten. Yeah. And then they visited this; it became eighteen. Uh, sorry, 20, yeah, 18, and then it visited this and it became 30. That's why it looks like it's 30 here, and n goes from 2 to 3. So at the end, after expanding both S3 here and here, this S2 node becomes Q equals 30, n equals 3. Right. That's my understanding. Right. Right. So, so there's basically one more value that it keeps track of, which is the score value. Which is this thing here, yeah. right, computed by this equation. Okay. Yeah. And I think they're evaluating this at each time step, right? Before, so it knows which part of the frontier to expand. Right? If you took AI before, you probably have 
done a star search or something like that, right? So it's uh, picking a node in the tree to expand based on um, the score as well as the, you know, the, the rarity of expanding that parent node, right? Which, which you said was governed by this, this right-hand side of the equation, right? Yeah, you could do that, but usually, according to CT, you usually from the root go that first, that first one whole trajectory and then start the root and then go a oh. so when you want to pick which child to go to then you use the you use the spot so you're saying for example i would start at the root you start s1 then, and then decide whether to go check to or s s2 or, or s2, s2. Right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah choose the a Okay. Yeah, you decide which action to take. Yeah. Which eight takes? So I wanted to decide a one, this one, or a one, yeah, this one, on right? The score, okay. And then you go there. Okay, so let's say and I go here. Again, you look at the score to decide to go to this one or this one. Decide which action, and then you yeah, you keep doing that. Okay, you uh, go down again and you keep on going. Yeah, when I finish the whole trajectory, then I then you come back here again. again. You see, it usually runs that way. Okay, so it's for a whole trajectory down. Yeah, people don't usually queue the user queue and uh, sort of best first time. They usually do sort of one trajectory. One trajectory at a time. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Shall we go on to the next slide? Let's thank our presenter. Uh, 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 next, I'll be talking about this uh, LQR linear quadratic regulation. Uh, I believe maybe all of you have uh, gone through the lectures by uh, Sergey. Uh, actually, the rest of the parts in Sergey's lecture notes actually are all math numbers and formulas. So I tried to find another uh, another alternative uh, uh, lecture notes, which I think might be more intuitive. Yeah, so, uh, so actually the theory of Optimal control is concerned with uh, operating a dynamic system at the minimum cost. In the case where the system dynamics are described by a set of a uh, linear differential equations, and if the cost is a, a quadratic function, then in this situation, we'll co we call, call it uh, the LQ problem which is a linear quadratic problem. And one of the main results in this uh, theory is actually the solution is provided by the LQR, which is a linear quadratic regulation. And the LQR is actually a feedback uh, controller. Uh, okay, to, to uh, uh, add some additional notes, because I take from uh, another uh, lecture notes, which is also uh, concerning the optimal control and the original lecture notes consists of uh, three sections. The first section is uh, regarding some uh, finite horizon MDPs, Markov uh, decision process. And section two is actually what I want to cover, which is uh, LQR. And the second three is actually uh, a DDP, a differential uh, dynamic programming. Uh, so I will uh, cover the LQR, but I will mention uh, something about uh, the finite horizon uh, MDP uh, in the next slides because it's linked to our uh, section two, which is uh, LQR. Uh, okay, so here we have uh, optimal policy in finite horizon MDPs, uh, which is the section one, as I mentioned, because it will be linked to the later section. Uh, so, we have the uh, optimal Bellman equation, as we've seen before. Uh, we have the optimal uh, value function, optimal policy. But, uh, okay. Yeah. 
Uh, but now here, uh, because I, I, I adopt another lecture notes, so they use this capital R as a reward function. So it's slightly different from the, uh, the, the small r which used in the Sergei's lecture notes. So once we have this uh, optimal Bellman equation, uh, which defines the optimal value function v of optimal policy pi, then through some uh, derivations and uh, yeah, I'll just skip these parts, then finally we got these two equations. Uh, yeah, so the uh, observations based on uh, iteration-based uh, approaches, we have uh, equation one and equation, equation two. Uh, then we can... Oh, yeah, then we can solve... We can solve the optimal value by these two steps. First, we compute the uh, optimal value using equation one. And from uh, time step t minus one uh, to zero, we compute the uh, value function uh, small t using uh, uh, value function t plus one uh, using uh, equation two. So uh, for next uh, sorry, for next slides, uh, because LQR is, LQR is used for so some uh, special case of the finite horizon settings. That's why we mentioned the uh, finite horizon MDPs in the uh, previous slide. And actually, a common technique in many control problem, uh, con control problem is to reduce the formulation to uh, such framework. So to limit the area which this LQR can apply, we need to make some assumptions. So for this model assumptions, uh, we have uh, actually status uh, state, which is uh, just n dimension n dimensional vector, and action is also uh, is d dimensional vectors. Then we also need to assume uh, linear transitions, uh, which is status at the t plus one is equal to uh, AT, ST plus BT, AT plus uh, WT, where the AT and BT are just unknown parameters, and ST is the status at time T, and uh, A, is a, A is the action at time T, and the WT is some uh, Gaussian noise with a variance uh, sigma T. Yeah. And we also need to assume the uh, quadratic rewards which is defined by uh, minus st transpose ut st minus at transpose wtat and here because we need to calculate this uh, reward function so actually ut and wt are known uh, and specifically they are positive definite uh, matrices so by the nature of the positive definite matrices, actually this ST transpose UT, ST is actually uh, always positive, uh, same as the second term. So the whole reward is actually always negative because we need to use this characteristic later. So we just do more ex explanation here. Okay, for this, um, LQR algorithms it consists of two steps. So first, we have this uh, uh, equation actually as a, a same as the last uh, slide, which is uh, st plus one is equal to at st plus bt at plus wt. Then we have three unknown parameters, which is a, b, and sigma, where the sigma is of the variance of the Gaussian noise. So we estimate, our estimations are based on the value ex approximation. Then first we collect transitions from an arbitrary policy. Then we use a linear regression to find uh, this following. We, find, uh, we need to find uh, A and B uh, using this uh, L2 norm um, square error. Then finally, sorry, uh, we need to 
solve this sigma also, but the sigma we need to use a technique which is covered actually in the original slide, which is a Gaussian discriminant analysis, but we will not be covered here. So what's the intuition behind uh, this, this linear regression step? What are we, what, what is it trying to do? Uh, Does anyone know? I think basically solve for uh, the parameters A and B. So can we look at the indices here? So there's an outer summation over I, I, I equals one to M. What, what is M? Is it the number of actions that can be taken? The number of trajectories. The number of trajectories to, to, to build, is that right? It's the number of samples, basically, that we're creating, a uh, number of trajectories. And then the inner summation is over all the time steps from uh, time t equals zero all the way to the horizon. The last, the last state uh, before the horizon ends, t minus one, right? I think so, based on that statement, it's just first collect transitions. Right. So you have uh, arbitrary policy determining m, m transitions. And then you're trying to uh, find the parameters A and B such that they minimize this L2, L2 loss, L2 norm between the state and the estimation of the state's value. Is that right? All right the one in the parentheses is the estimation done by A and B, right? Yeah. And then the S of I at T plus one is the actual value. Yeah. Okay. And so this is only optimizing for A and B, right? To say that uh, mm -hmm. I want my A and B matrices to represent uh, uh, S of T plus one as best as possible, given uh, the information I know about S of T. And then uh, to learn uh, sigma, which I guess is something like covariance. It's a variance of the Gaussian noise. Okay, yeah. it's a the noise term. So you're, I think, basically, yeah. I think the assumption is that the, the Gaussian noise is will not affect the overall uh, term too much. Okay. So that you can use this to estimate it first, then we try to consider uh, the Gaussian noise later. Okay. Everyone happy with, with that? I sort of get it. <laughs> so the W is noise for uh, stochastic current. Uh, from, from if you're at state T, you can take action T, there's a chance you go to one state, or there's a chance that you go to a different state. Some, uh, You're saying this is handling the stochasticity yeah. of the action, right? So if I take action A, it doesn't always land me in in the state that has the maximal value of, of it, right? So it's uh, dealing with the stochasticity of the transition. And so it's clear from the 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 sub uh, the subscript that the, the noise parameter is time variant, right? Okay. It's time variant, so, so it's, it will vary with time. I don't know, I'm, I'm oh. guessing because there's a WT, it's yeah, not just it's W. It's a subscript uh, of the 
Right. So it means that at every time step, it, it, the W value could vary. And uh, it says that it's proportional to a normal distribution centered at zero with, uh, with standard deviation of sigma t. Uh huh. You want to elaborate? Okay. No problem. I'm not that clear about that either. It might also be to model the uncertainty with which your sensor affects your state. W accommodates uh, some variation in what it affects your state. So it See if it's navigation, you use GPS as your GPS reading to stay. Mm -hmm. uh, this noise W could also represent the stochasticity of your measurement rather than the time. This is for dynamics. If you want observation noise that's separate, oh, there will be a separate situation. So this is dynamics, the next step. So by that you mean it has a, this noise term has to do with the stochasticity of the transition, right? Um, yeah, Not the measurement maybe, of the yeah. state. Maybe some random acceleration that's driving the system. Okay. The observation noise it might be different. So quite often you have another you observe it. This is the dynamics. Double check, right? Like the the up mean um, equations, right? Like um, I noticed that the matrix A doesn't really have a subscript T for it. Is it missing, or is it like um? Because okay, so your matrix A does it change with every time step, or is it like a constant throughout all, all your time steps? I think it changes with time. Yeah, yeah, things. Time runs. Uh, yeah, I think the, the subscript is missing there. Okay. Uh, I think so, it's actually constant, right? Is it constant? Yeah. Because if, if it doesn't make sense to use linear regression to find out mean of A and B across all the time steps, right? If it's if it's if it's time variant. Yeah. So the cost should then have been over. Um, yeah, so its notation is a bit strange because in step one there's an a t and a b t, but I, I think it makes more sense to have a single matrix, right, an a and a t, and that you're 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 trying to get this uh, these matrices for uh, uh, all time steps rather than a single time step. But if A and B are fixed, actually we just need to perform the linear regression once, then we can apply to all the predictions. Okay, yeah, I'm not that clear about this. It's Maybe we can try to explore from, it. from the, the LQR, like that. That, uh, that is in the lecture. Like, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so the LQ1 is like, it's like the F, the big F, T, and this is kind of, it's, it's time, variant, time variant, so. Time variant. Yeah, so that's why I'm not quite sure whether A, T should be time variant or time variant, because in the lecture, no, at least the dynamics uh, formula, like the F, T is time variant. Yeah. Okay. Then maybe we'll have to go try to sort that out offline. And okay, then, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then our scribes can try to figure out which one it is. Basically, I think it's time variant. It should be time variant. Yeah. Okay. I think the notation is just missing because they just want to put A and B there. Okay. In the first argument, A and B. Oh. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, I think that's that's why. But even in the second half of the equation in the L two norm, then it should be A T S T I, right? And B T A T I, right? Because the A and the B are supposed to be time specific. So like out of curiosity, like like there isn't a bias term in this equation. Uh I mean because like the, the one in the slide there, there's actually a, a, a bias term which is like the, the small f and but but there isn't a bias term in this um, formulation. So mm. seems to be Is it equivalent to the the noise uh, dimension? Yeah, I don't think it's equivalent to the noise term. Right? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, why don't we go ahead in the yeah. interest of time? No worries. It's good to explore. Okay, for a second step, uh, assuming that the parameters of our model are known, so either given or estimated with step one, then we can derive the optimal policy using dynamic programming. So parameters we mentioned here is actually uh, A, T, B, T, U, T, W, T, and Sigma. And among all, actually U, T, and W, T, I think we have known beforehand, and A, T, B, T, and Sigma, T, we derive from the last uh, step. So we want to compute the uh, optimal uh, value function. If we go back to section one, which is the, the MDPs I just mentioned, we can apply dynamic programming. So it will use, uh, it will finally use the optimal uh, choice of policies and actions, but they need to do some uh, uh, iterations. So first is the init initialization step. So for, for, for the last time step, capital T, uh, they use the fact actually we taken from, uh, uh, we know this here, actually this part is actually taken from, uh, sorry. It's taken from here. And we, we just expand it. All right, that was your uh, equivalence of reward, right? Yeah. So expand it because we just expand the uh, positive, positive uh, definite matrix here. So these two terms. Uh, always passed up larger or equal to zero. So to maximize uh, this one, we just make our action to uh, zero. Then we have this minus st transpose ut st transpose. And for then you walk backwards. Is that right? So that was the last time step t, mm -hmm. and then you're trying to recurse forward, uh, backward in time to the current time step, right? T zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is initialization step. Then you're going to show us the recurrent step, right? Okay, for recurrent step, so for, we have uh, t is more than the capital t, uh, the, the capital T. So we suppose we know. Uh, the value function at t plus one. So we have several facts. So first it can be shown that if uh, the value function at the optimal value function at the t plus one is a quadratic function in st, then the vt, uh, yeah, the vt is also a quadratic function. Um, in other words, there exists some matrix uh, 
Phi and some scalar psi such that uh, if we have this optimal value function regarding a state, uh, the state S T plus one is equal to this uh, uh, formula. Then we have another uh, quadratic function at uh, time t. Is it uh, clear about this one? I'm a little lost, but I don't know about the rest of you. Maybe you guys are following. Because the transitions in here. Yeah. You substitute in the linear transition in the quadratic function, you probably end up. Yeah, because the assumption here is that our value function is actually a set of uh, quadratic functions. So another fact is we can show that the optimal policy is just a linear function of the state. Knowing the optimal value at the t plus one is equivalent to knowing that uh, the phi and psi, uh, one is a matrix, another is scalar. Um, so we just need to explain how we compute uh, phi t and psi t from phi t plus one and psi t plus one. So basically we just need to compute the matrix and the scalar from uh, at time t from we know time t plus one. So we expand this uh, formula, uh, we get the following. Uh, so the last expression is actually a quadratic function, a quadratic function in uh, AT, which is action at the, uh, time T. And it can be easily optimized because we have uh, such identity. Yeah, basically it's just some techniques to uh, compute this part in a faster way. From this step, we can derive our optimal uh, action as follows. So uh, we can see that from here to here, actually the optimal policy is linear to our uh, uh, state, ST. Um, so given optimal action we can solve for phi and psi. And finally, we got this uh, called discrete Riccati equation to calculate uh, our psi, uh, phi and psi. So combine this, we can find that actually uh, phi t depends on neither psi or noise sigma. So uh, our optimal policy is, uh, sorry, uh, LT, which is the, the linear term here is a function of uh, AT, BT, and phi T plus one, it implies that the optimal policy uh, actually does not depend on the noise. But phi here, we have this sigma term. Uh, so actually, our optimal value function depends on this noise. 
but policy does not. What, what is LT? Uh, LT is the one we derived from the last term. What, what, yeah. what, what, what meaning does it have? Uh, basically, uh, we, we can derive our AT from this step. Uh, then in the form of this, Was it a policy? Uh, LT is actually like, uh, because they just isolate the uh, S, uh -huh. the state here. So they say AT is actually linear to ST because we can separate this. So it is the same. Uh, if you put these two first lines together, it says the optimal action at time t is a, a linear function lt of the state st. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a hard time parsing that fact for you. It says. As LT is not a function of AT, BT, and phi T plus one. Mm -hmm. Sorry, on the, the next slide. Oh. So, yeah. It implies the optimal policy also does not depend on the noise. But isn't the optimal policy V star T? Uh, the optimal policy, I think they defined in the first few slides. Auto C should be a function of the state. Right. C the state I can make an addition. But what is V star? V is the value at the state. Okay. Because this is our uh, assumption. Right, okay. There's many formulas we need to uh, try to connect from many slides. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, unless it would be so very easy. confusing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, to, to, to summarize how we uh, perform such actions, actually first step, we estimated parameters uh, A, B, and sigma. Then we do the initializ uh, initialization step. Uh, then we iterate doing the recurrence to update this phi psi uh, using the recoil, uh, discrete Riccati equations. And if there exists a policy that drives a state towards zero, uh, then convergence is guaranteed. <laughs> so I guess the nice thing about this algorithm is that your terms are linear or quadratic, so it's easier to that, I think, I think it's, it's basically based on the assumption here. Yeah. So we, uh, we assume uh, uh, you're making the assumption that the rewards are, are quadratic. Right? Yeah. yeah. So it's not necessarily a case, but you when you simplify it as that, then you have a, a tractable algorithm computation, right? Mm -hmm. That that was my understanding of what you were saying. You don't lose a lot of fidelity by doing that. You have enough model modeling power to get at many classes of problems by assuming a quadratic uh, uh, reward function. Yeah. Because I, I didn't cover uh, the rest of the parts in the Sergey's uh, lecture, which is uh, DDP, which is a nonlinear case. Mm. Yeah. Okay. You see the, the, the notes here I took from a uh, machine learning course, a uh, Stanford machine learning course. Okay. Yeah, the, there uh, are some. Two, uh, two, four. It's two, two, nine. Two, two, nine. Yeah. Okay. So. Great.
Great. Thanks for the presentation. So next week is week seven. It's our last week for the first half of the course. Um, we, I'll try to ensure that we have enough presenters for the second half of the course. That's usually the challenge. Um, so uh, until then, uh, if you haven't already put in your homework uh, in terms of declaring your project, uh, let, please do so. Um, and then I will, as I said, I will update the notes for um, the website so that it accurately reflects what you have to do, which is basically to update the STEPS website so that we have all of the information captured there for what you want to do. How many of you have started on your project at some point? I discussed it with Marcus the other day. Okay, good. good. Yeah, I think we're at that stage where we'd like to at least discuss and get things. I think as, as Sergey uh, pointed out for a lot of the warnings he said about homework, right? He said multiple <laughs> times, it takes a long time for any of these things to converge. So you probably want to at least uh, plan it in such a way that you're not waiting on week 13 for your CPU, GPUs to crunch out a result because then you're not going to get anything done. Okay. All right. So we'll see you all next week. Thanks for coming. See you guys. See you next week.